uh, I would like to, uh, to graciously thank you for the invitation to arrive here and to speak to the audience about this issue. Um, it's been a, uh, when I was talking to my wife this morning about, oh, how are you, you've been there several days now, right? And I said, well, actually I arrived yesterday morning at 3 a.m., so no, not probably several days, but I have already experienced quite a bit of amazing hospitality, including wonderful dinner last night, and of course this uh, very warm welcome. I've never seen such a big poster with my name before. I, I really <laughs> I, uh, I originally started off as a traditional geologist. My degree was actually in geology. And, uh, and that was uh, in, out of the University of California. I then spent a couple years overseas as a Peace Corps volunteer. And subsequently then uh, went on to my PhD in marine sciences, marine chemistry to be particular. It wasn't until I arrived at my faculty job that I started becoming really interested in what I think is a completely understudied aspect of our field, which is what relationship does our health have to do with the environment, and particularly environmental health? So my mission over the last 15 years has been to improve our understanding of how the environment impacts us as individuals and communities, and then how we can impact the environment through very fundamental sciences. Uh, so that's been my main emphasis in the last 15 years. And I'm so pleased to be able to share some of that here today and some of the research that we've been, we've been doing. Uh, I've been a professor uh, at Indiana University since 1994, uh, where I uh, proceeded through the normal ranks. I uh, formed a, a center there, the Center for Urban Health, in, uh, in 2009, uh, and uh, been the director of the Center for Urban Health since it started at that point. Uh, Indiana University is working very hard to always refresh itself. Uh, my campus has 30,000 students, and something like 1,500 faculty members, but we're still always trying to refresh ourselves. So I would like to acknowledge, first of all, the uh, support of a number of institutions that I've been working with, the uh, American Institute of Pakistan Studies, who is uh, sponsoring this entire uh, trip, of course. Uh, I'm, I happen to be an air quality fellow for the uh, embassy in Islamabad. I'll, I'll present that in a second. And I participate actively in a effort by the, um, by the U.S. State Department in the, what's called the Diplomacy Lab. So I've been working on that uh, for some time now. The diplomacy lab sites are designed so that we can particularly, I mean, sorry, the air quality fellow sites are designed so that we can uh, try to impart some of the expertise that American scientists have on air quality and health in an international context. So this is a placement of all of the air quality fellows, this is from last year, around the world. Most of those have been, they're requested by the embassies themselves. And most of them are centered in, in this, uh, this region of uh, Far East, Near East, and, and Africa. There's a specific reason why that is the case. And that is because, if I get my, my pointer finger correct, I'll do it the old-fashioned way too. Simply because, particularly for air, it's this swath of the world that has among the worst air quality on the planet, actually. So it swings all the way from Africa through the Middle East, through the Near East, and to the Far East. And so that's a real concern. And uh, it's a concern specifically because uh, bad air kills. Bad air takes years off of people's lives. This is an estimate uh, from last year's report, the 2018 uh, State of the Global Air Report, that shows over here that in these dark colored regions, the average individual who lives in those countries loses a year and a half of their life to bad air. So a year and a half of life lost to bad air. And I'll explain a little bit of the dynamics of why that is the case. But nevertheless, that's a tremendous impact on human lives. Not only that, not only that is it a year and a half lost, but a significant amount of disease, burden, and so forth while they're alive. So there's a significant cost. There. So, 
There's a number of these, these countries that reside in this region of this chart. This is just a simple chart of the concentration of bad air quality on the bottom and uh, how much you can gain in life expectancy. So there's countries down here, Japan, US, Brazil, Mexico, who um, tend to uh, not have, have pretty clean air. And then there's a whole cluster of countries up here, including Pakistan. And the whole point is, can we, can we export concepts and ideas and partnerships to bring these countries down here. And so that's what a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is not just telling you that bad air is bad for your health, but rather talk about ways that you can partner to improve the air in your region and to use unique partnerships, not just relying on the government, but rather partnerships with universities, like this university, and with non-for-profit organizations and so forth to improve air. So, I'm going to just flash out some headlines on bad air and health. Bad air takes years from people's lives. That was that figure from last time. Particulate matter impacts are far worse than previous thought. Emissions of a particular gas, particularly from automobiles, from vehicles, cause 10% of global um, asthma deaths. 10%. Poor air quality decreases cognitive function, so bad air makes people, lowers their IQ, makes them not as smart. So is this all old news? No. All of these are papers from last month alone. These are headlines from papers from March 2019. So this is a very current and ongoing understanding of the role that air quality plays on human health. So uh, sorry about the slide arrangement, but I can read it quite well on my slide. Uh, the science is pretty strong in air quality, but health impact and health impacts are becoming a little bit clearer, but action, not so much. So action on air quality relies on various sectors. There, we can think of these as relying on government and their ability to make regulations, uh, industries of willingness to uh, comply with some of those regulations, legal authorities to that. Yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I had my first question already. <laughs> uh, education and outreach around um, some of these issues so the public is aware. These are all, all ways in which action is taken. But I'll tell you a disconcerting aspect about air quality in some countries, including unfortunately in Pakistan, the air quality has not improved in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, you could have had a person like me standing up here and telling, telling you the sources of, the, of bad air the sources of bad air have not changed. Right? And in fact, there's some, some significant work by in Pakistan trying to identify the bad air and identify ways to, to improve it. But it has not improved yet. So clearly, action has not been taken yet. And so I'm hoping to provide you with other ways in which action might be taken that uh, are a little bit more comprehensive. So I would argue that all of these have to be pursued. But Really, one part that has been missing, not just here in Pakistan, of course, but all around uh, the, the world, is engaging communities with problems. Mm 